Okay, so we teach in a great books program. Do you read any of these books to your kids or do they read any of them? Well, that's a funny question for me because I've got a kid in the program and he reads all these books <laughs> and we get to talk about them. But I think what you mean is like when they're younger, before mm -hmm. they ever uh, get to the age right. of our students, right. do we read to them? Yeah, right. I think it's, I actually went into the, one of the children's classrooms for their sort of like, what does your parent do for work day? And I uh -huh. dressed in my academic duds. And I brought Plato and I brought Dante. Uh, my children are two daughters, six and eight. Um, and, and from when they were young, they get interested uh -huh. in what I'm reading. So they, they want to know what it's about. And if they ask me, I will tell them and I'll read them a passage that goes with it. And I'll, maybe I'll simplify the language okay. about it for them a little bit. Yeah. Um, but they already know that I'm engaged in this this reading life that, uh -huh. that matters. And I'll, I'll tell them why I think it matters as well. So even though I'm not going to be reading long stretches of Plato to them or long stretches of Anna Karenina, I will read them parts of it yeah. and try to bring them into the reading life that I have because that's so much of the center of, of how I'm looking at the world and trying to become more wise. Right. Yeah, my, my kids are a little bit older, so we have the rule, if they read it, they can come. So if they, you know, so if I'm teaching class on Homer, uh, if they read it, they can come. So when Reuben was 10, he read the Odyssey, came to class, he's mm -hmm. read some Boethius, things like that. Overall, though, most of these books aren't accessible to kids. So how does being a great books, you know, a great books uh, professor, great books person, how does that shape how you, how and what you read with your kids? Mm. Well, I think one of the maybe a answers for a lot of us is Narnia. <laughs> and that is, I sometimes say there's two kinds of Tory students. Uh, one is the kind that has, been, has their parents read them Narnia when they were three and four and uh -huh. has been reading. And so all the way through Tory, they're saying, oh, like in Prince Caspian, oh, uh, <laughs> like in Lion, uh -huh. the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And the other kind of student, they didn't have that opportunity, so then the rest of their life, or, or when they get, you know, when they have kids, uh, then they're going to read them and they're going to think, oh, like in Spencer, oh, <laughs> just like in Plato. And so it's, uh, uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is C.S. Lewis is kind of a gateway drug for our kids <laughs> 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 into the uh, classics uh -huh. that we read in uh, Tory. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think we've had a lot of fun as well, reading, whatever we read, reading things together. So even my daughters are, are both thrilled with becoming independent readers. Uh -huh. they, they've been asking, they actually actively ask us not to read to them because they want to go read their own things. But one of the things they really love is if they see me reading the same book. Yeah. which I often do. So pretty much anything that they're reading, I want to read. Yeah. Sometimes because it's rubbish and I want to help them see that. Um, and, and, but sometimes because it's awesome and I want us to have the experience of it together and then we get to talk about it. Yeah. So part of our program is you read to talk, to become wise together and to share insights together. So all, part of what I do then is to, to read, even when it's not like a great book per se, or even it's not what I would be reading, I'm reading along with them. So I have a huge a huge diet of children's literature yeah. in my reading life, yeah. and I've always got something on the bedside table that's something that they would be reading or that they might be interested in. And they, they just love it. They, they want to talk about things yeah. with me. And they they want to study the Bible independently now for similar reasons, not because they're necessarily like super mm -hmm. pious children, but because it seems the right thing to do with their reading life. Yeah. Is to read the whole Bible. Yeah. But I think like Lewis and Tolkien and others that uh, they're a special case because mm -hmm. they've been so deeply influenced by the books that we read mm -hmm. that uh, that that in fact uh, you know I, I've often people have asked me like so what uh, classical education did you get <laughs> and they said well <laughs> none really <laughs> yeah. basically yeah. I read C.S. Lewis then I tried to read all the books that he read and then I you know ended up getting something like a Tory education mm -hmm. but so but I feel like when I'm reading a, a, an author like Lewis to my kids I'm actually giving them secondhand what I got directly mm -hmm. uh, from the text that we read yeah yeah, w one of the things we do is we just we read out loud to our kids a ton. So we probably work through about a book a month with them. Yeah, it, it you know changes over the course of the year. Um, but my kids would just read Percy Jackson over and over and over again if I if I let them. <clears throat> so our rule is, and that is uh, d drawing yeah, on the it, classical it myths and so <laughs> on. But I uh, but for, for a every difference. for every contemporary book, young adult uh, or, young, or kids book that they read, they need to read a classic. Now for them, that can that doesn't mean Homer. Uh, that kind of means anything before 1980. <laughs> they, they, but, but more importantly than that, those stories are often putting putting them either in another world yeah. or way back in time. Yeah. So they're just soaked in Little House on the Prairie, and mm. they, they can imagine life being different. They mm. can access a world where there wasn't electricity and things like that. Um, 
or not not available on the prairie at least, mm -hmm. and um, you know that gives them such a fruitful imagination. And then those books that they're reading are also drawing from the classics we read, so it's giving them this indirect access. Mm. So yay for Lewis, but we have him reading um, Roald Dahl, we have him mm -hmm. reading Hardy Boys, Little House on the Prairie, all sorts <laughs> of different things. Uh, so their minds are just full of different worlds mm. uh, in a way that really helps them think. Yeah, I think that we, we've done something similar in part because I don't want the children to only have an imagination and, and a moral imagination even that, that, that can only be defined by the last 30 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really want them to, to have a mind that's being reinforced by the best of what kind of human history has to offer. Yeah. So I'm also interested in and trying to get them to read anything that has has a, a, even a pre-1900 history, pre-1800 history, as far uh -huh. as I can go back. Yeah. Um, so that, that will often include things like legend. Uh -huh. It will include stories about the saints. It will include uh -huh. stories um, like Chinese folk myth. It yeah. will choose anything that, that, that include anything that has like kind of a longer history, anything that, that feels really different from what they're used to. Um, and sometimes you find books like, uh, there's a, The Green Ember right now by S.D. Smith. One of the nice things about that is, even though it's a contemporary book, um, he's writing it, uh, one of the big central ideas is what do you do, when the world is collapsed um, and everything's falling apart, mm -hmm. how do you live? And one mm -hmm. of the ways, one of the answers to that question is, you live like the mended wood, like the, the mended world mm -hmm. is coming and you need to be the kind of person who can live in that world. Yeah. Um, and I think, well, you never, you never read that yeah. <laughs> idea yeah. in those kind of terms. So even though it's a contemporary book, it's actually referencing kind of an older yeah. idea about what does it mean to live in the in-between times or to live when disaster strikes in a way that you don't usually hear. So I've always got my eye out for books for them where even if it's not necessarily a pre-1900 book, mm -hmm. it's a book that has an older soul yeah. behind it. Yeah, uh, Lewis has that inscription at the beginning of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to Lucy, saying something like, by the time you read this, you, may, you, know, you might be past enjoying it, but someday you'll pick it up and enjoy it again. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I benefit so much more from those books than my kids do. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's funny watching them think they're the ones, that this is for them, and they're the ones getting it. Mm -hmm. It's just for me, <laughs> but of course they benefit along the way. Well, the best children's books are ones that adults can read with pleasure over and over again. Amen. The Tory Honors Institute at Biola University. Biblically centered, great books, liberal education. More at biola.edu slash Tory.